It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of June 6, 2003. We've got three films to look at today, but none bigger than our first movie here, which is, of course, the sequel to The Fast and the Furious, or what some people may consider to be the gay one. I'll explain more when we talk about the trailer for... Uh, we show you the trailer first for Too Fast and Furious, then we'll talk about why it's called that. I mean, come on, even the marketing for this movie is gay. I mean, like, do it fast, do it furious, like, come on, like, like they weren't even trying to hide the homoeroticism in this, because there's surprisingly a lot of it, I mean, but, um, yeah, this is uh, the sequel to The Fast and Furious. Uh, they couldn't get half the cast to come back, but Paul Walker said, I ain't doing nothing else, I'll come back for it, why not? I mean, and in here you have him returning as ex-LAPD officer Brian O'Connor and his ex-con friend Roman Pierce, played by Tyrese Gibson. They go on a transport a shipment of dirty money from shady Miami business import-export dealer Carter Verone, played by Cole Hauser, while secretly working with an undercover agent, played by Ava Mendes, to bring Verone down. And, um, let's talk about the whole, what I was talking about before, um, yeah, there is a lot of gay tendencies in this movie. The way that, you know, Tyrese and Paul Walker, you know, when they're co having that camaraderie together, you would almost swear that this is Brokeback Mountain and you're expecting these two to bang at some point. Even Jake Gyllenhaal and Heath Ledger would be looking at this and going, guys, say, guys, we don't, we're supposed to do that in our movie. You're not supposed to be doing this in this film. I mean, it gets to those insane levels. It's just like, am I really watching a movie that's really trying to promote, get, promote hom homos like promote gay people, gay action stars? I mean, if it is, I mean, I wouldn't mind it. I mean, it actually would be a pretty interesting idea for an action film to have two gay, to have two gay guys, but I don't think that's what they were going for. I think that was poor, I think that was a bad intention for what they were trying to go for here, but they didn't hide it very well because it's clearly there, and, um, and, uh, yeah, it's definitely noticeable when you really look at it, but, um, it's but, but besides all that, it's definitely not as good as the other fast as the first Fast and Furious movie. It's definitely a film that is suffering a lot from sequelitis, but sometimes the action can look pretty good, and it is interesting to see John Singleton do something that's kind of outside of his norm. I think this was actually the first big blockbuster film he's ever directed, if I'm not mistaken. I think the, the closest he's ever done before this was Shaft, and he's never gone back ever since, probably for good reasons, because the film was not well received. In fact, he hasn't really... Look at his photography here. He has not really done a whole lot since uh, after this movie came out, he did one great film in Four Brothers, and then he followed it up with easily the worst movie of his career, and that is Abduction. And um, that's the last thing he directed before he passed away. So that's the thing that really... Because he passed away in uh, 2019, if I'm not mistaken, and he goes out with a Taylor Lautner movie that was really terrible from the beginning. But, um, but uh, you know, I mean, I give him credit for at least trying to do something outside of his norm, and... I'd say it's not a good movie, but it definitely has some stuff in there that I think is... It makes it worth it. Like, I I joke about the fact that Paul Walker and Tyrese come out they're gay in this movie, but they do work off each other very well. And thankfully, with the sequels that they were in afterwards, they do they do have better chemistry in those films that that's kind of established in here, but it's kind of hard not to overlook the obvious um, gay tendencies they have together. But, um... But uh, Ava Mendez is really good here. I mean, she. I mean, she's. I mean, she is very attractive in this. Uh, you also have uh, Tyrese. Uh, I just said Tyrese Gibson. Cole Hauser as the as a villain. Uh, Chris uh, Ludacris Bridges is also in here for the first time. James Romare, you know, great actor he is. I mean, there are things to appreciate about the film in general. It's definitely a step down compared to the compared to the original film and. As for, you know, considering some of the worst movies to come after this, I mean, we're we're going to have the, ne the next one being Tokyo Drift, which is not a good film. And then down the road, we have Fated the Furious, and then, you know, F9. Well, actually, I liked F9. Fast X, you know. Yeah, this is no longer one of the worst Fast and Furious movies, because F Fated the Furious and F and uh, Fast X still exist. But, um, but yeah, uh, overall, it's fine. There's nothing really that bad about it, per se. It's just not really as good as the original film. And I do give it credit for trying to do something a little bit different than the first movie did. I mean, it's not just them remaking Point Break. It's them trying to actually continue a storyline and expand on it with at least one of the main characters. But even then, that didn't work out. And the film didn't do bad business, per se. But the negative reviews, I think, probably killed any opportunities to have everybody come back for at least the next film. And then 
they kind of rebranded the series after that with Fast and Furious in 2009, which we'll get to that one in about what, six years' time. But, um, yeah, not much more I can say about that one. Too Fast and Furious, fine for what it is, but definitely not one of the better Fast and Furious movies, per se. So, that was the big new release. But uh, let's get to a movie that actually is trying to involve gay, pe gay people in a positive light. Uh, whether intentional or not, but well, I mean, in Too Fast and Furious, it was it was hard to tell if that was intentional or not. But this one is clearly intentional. The next movie we have here, and that is Mumbo Italiano. Clearly, a film that was trying to cash in on the My Big Fat Week wedding phenomenon. Which, even by the time this movie came out, that movie had that movie's uh, the zeitgeist of that movie was pretty much dead and buried because, of course, you had the TV series that came after that. And even when that TV series ended, it was already pretty much dead on that point, dead at arrival on that point. But um, we're well, not here to talk about that movie. We're here to talk about uh, Mambo Italiano, which is a story where you have uh, Angelo, Angelo Barberini, is, who is the oddball son of Italian immigrants Gino and Maria. Gino is played by Paul Sorvino who inadvertently ended up in Canada rather than the United States. Angelo shocks his parents and his sister Anna by moving out on his own without getting married, and shortly after that shocks them further when she, further still when he reveals that he is gay. But his boyfriend and childhood best friend, policeman Nino Paventi, isn't as ready to come out of the closet, especially not to his bus, bus, busybody Sicilian mother, Lena. And, um... Uh, yeah, this is a film that did not get the best reception when it came out. It was a film that got mostly mixed to negative reviews. I mean, it was Rotten Tomatoes' consensus is that it's a broad, shrill comedy that plays like a sitcom, and when you watch the trailer in full, you can definitely see that being the case. I mean, there is a clever concept in here that maybe could have worked if they had a better writer or director involved in it, but as it is, it just feels like a film that just kind of feels like, yeah, a sitcom, like a bad sitcom, like... Like this is the type of show that probably would have been would have been right up there with Will and Grace, except Will and Grace was actually a good show around this time period, and this probably would have been that show that was trying to copy the Will and Grace formula and just kind of fail miserably at it, be gone after a couple of episodes on of, of the television. Like I said, there is a good there is a good concept over here, a good premise in general, but it just doesn't really fe really go the route that it wanted to go. It's trying to be like I said, it's trying to be the next My Big Frack Week wedding, and Roger Ebert himself even said that it's inconvenienced as My Big Fat Gay Wedding. I mean, he, I mean, it's literally trying to be the equivalent of that, and uh, I say it looks like a sitcom, but sure enough, there was actually a sitcom that came out of this, uh, Ciao Bella, which is a show that explores similar themes of culture class and are examined in the film and the play it was based upon. Uh, Cla Claudia Ferry, who plays Angela's sister, Anna, in Mambo Italiano, plays the lead role in Ciao Bella. Um... Obviously, I've never seen the show because I don't live in Canada, and I don't know exactly uh, what the show is. What the show is, but um, it ran for one season, which pretty much tells you everything you need to know about how well that did. But, um, but yeah, I really don't know anything more about this movie. I mean, it's a film that is a film that really I saw it once. I never really had any intentions of seeing it again after that. It's just like you had a good idea here, but it just didn't take it to that next level where it would have been ma made it a comedy masterpiece or something like it would have been a really good movie. Maybe if they had a better director involved, a better writer in general they probably would have had something but as it is it's just there. It's just a, n a movie that's trying to be a My Big Fat Week winning clone and not really working out that well. So yeah, not much more to say about that one. Mambo or Taliano. So let's go ahead and take a look at the last one we have here. The more successful of the two independent releases this weekend Keisha Cashel Hughes in Whale Rider. So in the film, you have Keisha Cashel who's playing a 12-year-old Maori girl whose ambition is to become the chief of the tribe. Her grandfather believes that this is a role reserved for males only. And, of course, a story is developed through there. And um, uh, this is the film that, like I said, launched Keisha Cashel Hughes's career. She was actually nominated for the Oscar for Best Actress, which, at the time, she was the youngest actress to ever be nominated for the Oscar, breaking Isabella Johnny's record when she was 20. But she held that record for nine years before uh, Cravani Wallace took all, took the nomination for Beasts of the Southern Wild when she was only nine years old. And uh, you can definitely see why she was nominated because this is a star in the this is a star making performance for her, and it really does show what she would later bring to the table with stuff like uh, the Nativity Story, and then later on on Game of Thrones where she was one of the um, where she was one of the Sand Snakes and. Um, 
it's a really good movie. It's a film that's very thought provoking. It's a film that really keeps you invested in what's going on in the storyline. It's a very powerful film, boasted by that performance. You also have Cliff Curtis in here giving a great performance as well. This is directed by Nikki Caro, who's gone on to direct a lot of notable films on uh, North Country, which is a criminally underrated Charlie Theron movie. Uh, she also did, um, uh, this person also did, um, Nikki Caro's a woman, right? Yeah, she's a woman. Okay, I got it right the first time. Uh, she also did another underrated film, McFarland, USA, and then she followed it up with um, Mulan, the live-action one, which was not that great. But then again, it really wasn't her fault. It was just a bad Disney live-action remake. And, um, uh, which I did which at the time I didn't mind it, but as I've watched it multiple times since, not good. It's, it's a film that I've definitely noticed a lot more flaws of as I've, as I've gotten, as the years have gone by. But, um, but this is a really good film. I mean, I really don't think I need to say too much more about this one that hasn't already been said already. It's a star-making performance for Keisha Cashel Hughes. It's a very intriguing, thought-provoking storyline with a great cast, some great visuals, great storytelling. It's just a really damn good movie. I can't recommend it enough. Whale Rider, definitely check this one out. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. And the next time we meet, we'll take a look at three more movies, uh, three notable misfires at the box office. Um, Rugrats Go Wild, the crossover between the Rugrats and the Wild Thornberries. We also have Harrison Ford and Josh Hartnett in Hollywood Homicide. And we also have Dumb and Dumber, the prequel to Dumb and Dumber, When Harry Met Lloyd. I will tell you this, one of these three movies is actually a lot better than people let on, and uh, I'll let you figure out which one that is, and then we'll talk about it on the next episode. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So, with that said, I'm off, I will see you guys next time, and until then, as always, take care.